Welcome back to the Hopkins Demonstration Forest, or if this is your first time, welcome. Uh, this is a follow-up to last week's water quality down here at Little Buckner Creek. And today we're going to be looking at aquatic macroinvertebrates. Now what is a macroinvertebrate? Well, a macroinvertebrate, it's, it's a group of organisms that doesn't have an internal skeleton. And here they, they live part of their life or their entire life in water. What that means if they only live a portion of their life in water, some of these organisms go through metamorphosis. They have gills, they're in the water, they're taking in that dissolved oxygen that we tested last week, using that, and then when they're ready, they emerge from the water and carry on the rest of their life. Sometimes they spend a few months to a few years in the water to only come out and, and live on land for a few days. So why are macro invertebrates important to our water quality and our system here uh, in Hopkins and, and around Oregon. Well, they're the food source for some of the larger animals, that part of the food chain. So if we have good water quality for fish, like we found we had last week, when we checked the temperature, the turbidity, the clarity, the pH, as well as that dissolved oxygen, they all checked out. Well, now we need to see if there's food available for some of these animals and organisms that live here in Little Buckner Creek. So the way we're going to do that is take a sample. Now it's really hard to get in there. Uh, it's pretty shallow. I mean, we could get a, a mask and a snorkel or some goggles and look around. But a real easy way, uh, maybe some things you have at home. And you could even try this uh, if you have a small body of water, even a little uh, pond um, in your backyard, around your area that you could go visit and uh, take a sample. One of the things you need to do your collection that we're going to be using uh, is a small net. Now, uh, this is just a little cheap aquarium net. You can make something a little larger uh, using maybe uh, some cheesecloth or some type of cloth that the water can run through. You'll see why that's important. But what we're going to really use today is a uh, device that's it's a, it's a little higher tech. Um, it's meant for doing actual aquatic surveys. It's called a D-net. You can probably tell by the, uh, the shape. Looks like a D. And uh, we're going to be using this to collect some of those aquatic macroinvertebrates. So, show you how that works. But the next thing we'll need uh, to put our collection in as we start scooping up parts of the uh, water and the uh, stream bed uh, is a collection bin. Probably have something like that laying around the house. We need something to look a little closer. These things, some of them are big, some are small. So a little magnifying glass. This happens to be kind of a fancy aquatic viewer that we're using. But any magnifying device will work. Uh, you can even use the camera if you have that on a phone or some type of electronic device. And then we need uh, to have something to sort those critters with. You know, we don't like to handle them, pick them up sometimes, they're kind of small. So we have our beautiful high-tech sorting tray. Yes, an ice tray. Make sure you ask before you take that out of the freezer. Uh, and then also, maybe some of you uh, have a turkey or two uh, during the year and have a turkey baster. So, some very simple devices that we're going to be using. But basically, a lot of these critters, uh, the water, especially in a stream, is moving. Uh, if it was a pond, kind of the same thing. They stay down on the bottom. Some feed on the top. A lot of them are down on the bottom. Uh, feeding on the different uh, algae, the plant material, the uh, decomposing um, waste of some of the animals that are in the stream. Uh, they feed on a lot of that stuff, they break it down and again start that food chain and that cycle uh, going up to the larger animals. So the way this works, it's pretty simple. Uh, a lot of people think you get in there and start scooping around. Um, well, that, that kind of you can do that, it works. But a lot of the animals and critters are hiding under rocks. Uh, they're staying out of the the heavy where the water's flowing, and um, it, it does them better just to be under a nice, safe, protected area. So the way this works, pretty simple. Uh, there's a whole bunch of techniques to actually doing official surveys. We're just going to be capturing uh, some of the basic organisms. So basically what you do, the nice thing is D-shape, works really well. You place it on the bottom, find a nice spot in the stream flow. You notice the water is not filling up. If you can see down that far, uh, the water flows right through it. But the screen in the back captures any uh, small particle of the soil, some of that sediment, as well as those macroinvertebrates. You place it in the water, kind of lift the rock up, give it a little stir, let the water just kind of drive it in. And in there, you've captured some of the material under that uh, rock. 
I'm going to keep doing that a few places up here, upstream, a little bit. Kind of, you can take and scrub some of the rocks. Just let that water and stream kind of flow in. And then when you get a sample, come over to your... collection. Give it a little water and you can see in the bottom we've uh, this was clean before we started we captured some of the uh, organic material on the bottom some of the uh, rocks but let's take a look and see what we got in that one quick grab. I also came out and spent just only about five, 10 minutes tops, uh, made about 10 dips down the stream and captured some critters that we have here in the stream. So I'm gonna head up and we'll try to see if we can take a look at some of this. So we're gonna start, I'm gonna move the camera now and see if we can take a look down into this bin. If you look really close right there, I'm trying to make sure I see it. You see there's a little critter swimming around. So I take my turkey baster. I can get him out of there. And put him in my collection tray. If you take a nice close look in there, I can hold it still enough. You'll see there's a little critter, macroinvertebrate. I can then take that macroinvertebrate, put it under the magnifying glass. See if I can get that in focus. This will be kind of tricky, I know. The best I can. Yeah, it's not working too good with the glare. So we'll kind of toss that out of the way. Um, but hopefully you can get a kind of a close look at what that is. Pause it a little bit. There's some sediment in there. But if you take a close look, you'll notice that thing has two little tails on it. So one of the things you're going to need to do is go on, if you do this at home, uh, you need to have a guide. And I already kind of pre-located a few pages in this guide. This is a real basic guide. Um, and there's the animal that we were looking at, or the organism, the macroinvertebrate. And you'll see it is a Stonefly had two tails. I saw that right. So I actually captured one a little earlier. It was a bit bigger. And we're gonna, sorry, get this out. And you can see it in there in the collection. A lot larger one. Um, there's different species of stoneflies. There's some smaller ones and some, some giant stonefly. But uh, this animal, uh, currently organism, has gills. It lives in the water and will eventually emerge uh, to head out and reproduce and basically uh, live a very short life outside of the water uh, compared to how much it spends in. So I'm going to put that back in the, the bin. We'll release these when we're all done. Uh, another one that I found earlier Looks a little different. And if you can get a close look at that, I'll put it here on the white background. If you take a close look at this one, the tails aren't quite that easy to see, but this one has actually three tails. So three tails, in this case, three tails versus that stone fly. Um, and this isn't always a perfect way to do it, but, but by and large, two tails here in Little Buckner is our, our stoneflies. A lot of different varieties, and three tails are the mayflies. And again, you can see on the very back of that mayfly, there's some little tiny feathers, and uh, the gills on these uh, organisms are in different places. But just like the stonefly, the mayfly will be living there in the stream. Uh, almost all of its life in the water. It emerges, comes out, sometimes just a few days. Uh, it's back uh, to the water uh, laying eggs, and then it dies and becomes uh, food for the fish. 
So that's uh, the next question is, uh, is going to be what else outside of the macro invertebrates? Now here's kind of another cool one. It, 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 you look really close, you look in there and say, hey, all, all I see are some rocks. Well, if you look nice and close at that big, large rock, you'll notice a little head popping out of it, and it might even be moving around a little. Well, those are the caddisflies. And the caddisflies, uh, I was lucky enough to find this one just by netting, but uh, looking at the caddisfly, that one in there. The caddisflies uh, often attach under rocks and uh, build these little cocoons. Sometimes they're made out of sticks, sometimes this one out of stones. And uh, those caddisflies do the same thing. They have gills, go through metamorphosis. When they're ready, they emerge. But in the meantime, they can become food to a variety of uh, larger animals. So what are some of those larger animals, uh, as well as macroinvertebrates? And here I captured some Crayfish, crawdads. Um, there's three in there. Um, kind of a tiny one in the back. And uh, obviously these things can go pretty large. Maybe some of you have gone crawdadding before. But a crawdad is a macroinvertebrate, a fairly large one. It has no internal skeleton. And this one uh, spends life. Uh, I've seen them across, crossing land occasionally. But uh, they, they spend most of their life, almost the entirety of it, uh, in the water uh, if uh, they don't really choose to ever want to get out. So I have seen them on, on land occasionally, but, but rarely do you see that happen, uh, but only for a few, few brief moments. Put those back in there. But now the real kind of cool thing that I captured, and um, sorry if I'm wiggling the camera too much, but hopefully you can see this. That is a little fish. So uh, we know that we obviously have fish in here now because I caught this fish uh, with a D-net just down, um, well, about where, the, as far as there's a pool down there, a couple of them, and I went underneath uh, into one of the deep pools and kind of did a quick sweep with a net and pulled uh, this little, little, uh, little fish out. So um, I am not a perfect fish expert, but I have been told by those that are experts uh, that that is a cutthroat trout and um, they are uh, landlocked here so they don't actually make it out to the ocean because there's some barriers along the way but uh, we do have a good population of these little fish the biggest one i've seen here is about six inches so what does all this tell us about the stream well you look at this stretch of the stream and it's fairly um it's not the greatest example of our stream uh, but this stream right here really had a, a heavy storm event happen in 1996. And this portion really kind of took some of the uh, material out, uh, the rocks, the, uh, the wood, the large uh, uh, logs and stumps that were kind of making pools for the fish. But Buckner Creek is a very small creek. As you head up, uh, we get a lot more of that organic uh, matter into the stream, like the log jams and the little sticks that create those pools and habitats. But in this stream, we also have sculpin and lamprey eel have been found. So it's a pretty good, uh, robust stream. A lot of people look at it and say, mm -mm, uh, there's no fish in here, it's too small. But fish are amazing. They can be found in a lot of places as long as that water is healthy. So again, why do we do that survey? Well, we wanted to look and see some of the critters in here. And also those organisms, those critters, can tell us about the quality of the water. Now, oftentimes when you find a crawdad in water, you can usually tell that it's not terribly polluted in the sense of uh, how an aquatic organism views it. So crawdads don't have a lot of tolerance for water quality that's low or that is, has pollution of any sort in it. Um, they can handle kind of a medium to a uh, low pollution level. Now, some of these things like the uh, caddisfly, uh, are very sensitive to pollution and uh, poor water quality. So when you find those things like that stone little cocoon we sh I showed you, the caddisfly, um, as well as the mayflies, that's an indication usually of good quality water. So again, good water quality check last week, and uh, we found some macroorganisms, uh, macroinvertebrates uh, in the water today. So check on the food, check on water quality, little Buckner Creek um, hits all the marks. So. Thanks for watching and uh, hopefully you learned a little bit and come back soon. Thanks.